Well, if you have your Bible this morning, we're going to look at a couple of different chapters in the book of Exodus. So you can make your way there now. Uh, as always, there's Bibles in the back if you don't have one, or you can always dial that up on your smart device that you have. But we're going to be uh, looking at some background in Exodus chapter 22, and then we're going to kind of look at a core passage out of Exodus 33. And, and really what I want us to see is just kind of taking a, a quick glance at the, this relationship that, that Moses had with God. And as Moses is trying to, to lead people, in fact, the people who were rebellious and the people who were disobedient frequently to uh, the instructions of God, we, we see an interesting dialogue about God's goodness at the end of that passage we'll look at in Exodus 33. So if you'll go there with me, we're in week three of this series called Good, celebrating who God is all the time. And just by way of reminder, uh, if you're new with us or if you're watching with us for the first time, we started at the beginning of this year. Uh, Of course, we were thinking it would be a normal year, uh, but this has been such a timely message series for where we are. And we're really just going through uh, the fruit of the Spirit in Scripture. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, is where we are. Gentleness will come in August, and we're, we're going to keep making our way. And, and really, the heart of all of this is that we want to live lives that produce. As the people of God, people that are pursuing the things of God, we want our lives to be productive. So last week, or really the last two weeks, we've looked at the life of David as we've kind of gotten deeper into this understanding of God's goodness. And here's a quick recap. So last week, we looked at Psalm 34, and the, the anchor verse for us was that verse you might be familiar with where it says, taste and see that the Lord is good. And it was an invitation of David to invite others to experience the goodness of God. And so we said these four things last week. To fully experience God's goodness, we will praise Him in the good and the bad. We talked about our worship and how when we experience God's goodness, we don't just praise Him when things are good. We praise and we worship Him when things are going bad. We also said this, that to fully experience God's goodness, we will worship Him individually and collectively. And I think that's an important aspect of of having spiritual disciplines in our life, that not only do we need time with God personally, we need personal worship, we also celebrate collectively God's goodness through corporate worship. We also said this, to fully experience God's goodness, we will enjoy Him personally. And we're going to talk about that more today, about really having an experience with God, really understanding what it means to have discipline in our life, margin, where we spend intentional time with God every day celebrating His goodness. And then the last thing we mentioned because of the verse... In 34, 8 was when we fully experience God's goodness, we will invite others to experience him. Meaning that God's goodness has made such an impact on our lives that we want others to be a part of that. And so today we're going to kind of look at the life of Moses. And it's interesting because Moses has a very deep relationship with God. He has a very close, intimate walk with God. And there's a lot of dialogue that they have back and forth together. And we're going to see how through this dialogue and through some things that, that Moses goes through in his relationship with God, how he shows us how to have God's goodness in our life. And so before we kind of dive into that, I want to ask you this question because I think this gives us boundaries for today because I think there's some tension in this message about our own relationship with God. And here's the question. Have you been with God this week? When you think over the last week or maybe the last few weeks, has there been time in your life, time in your every day that you've been with God, that you were intentional to, to set aside time with God, to hear from God, time that's uninterrupted and undisturbed. And I know there's, there's practical things that we could do in our life. Maybe we listen to worship on the way somewhere or throughout our day we'll have times of prayer. But I think it's really important that in the course of our day, there's time where we sit alone with God by ourselves and we hear from Him. We take in His Word and we pray and we worship and we meditate and we memorize and we hear from Him and then we obey. So in your life and in my life, have we taken time to be with God? Because as we mentioned last week and what we'll see in the life of Moses, we miss so much of God's goodness when we simply aren't spending time with God. And so if we really want to experience the goodness of God, then we must learn to be with God. It's an important discipline and habit in our life that has to be developed or we'll miss so much of God's goodness. We will read about God's goodness, but we won't experience God's goodness in a way that he desires us to if we won't find time to be with him. So I think the great tension for us, especially looking at this message, is that often in our lives, I think we miss aspects of the goodness of God simply because we really don't want any more of God in our life. 
I think most people develop spiritual habits to the extent that they can get enough of God that it doesn't disrupt their life very much. Most people will find a way to to be a part of a church, even if it's just Sunday morning attendance, or there'll be something that they read. But I think if we're not careful, we'll miss some of the deep aspects of God's goodness because we only allow so much of God into our lives. And what we see in the life of Moses was a man that deeply wanted more and more and more of God in his life. You see, he, he led a people who struggled in their relationship with God. And what we see throughout this story is that God continually is with Moses and he keeps saying to Moses, Moses, I'm finding favor with you. I'm finding faithfulness with you. But these people that you're leading, God uses this phrase, they're a stiff-necked people, which is a, a word that, that we would use the word rebellious or uh, a people that were unteachable. And in this dialogue, Moses keeps going to God on behalf of these people that are so disobedient. And God says, Moses, I'm finding favor with you. And I'm finding you to be faithful. But the people that you're leading are so disobedient. They're so spiritually arrogant. They don't want any more of me or my goodness. And so Moses had experienced this deep unity with God and the goodness that was the result of it. And he desperately wanted the people that he was leading Israel to experience it. But they most most of the time were not open to that. So in much of the book of Exodus, Moses is in dialogue with God. He goes up to Mount Sinai. And obviously a a highlight of that is chapter 20 where he receives the Ten Commandments. So there's a a continual back and forth of Moses going up the mountain to be with God, coming down, delivering the word of God to the people. That was the primary responsibility of a prophet, which was to hear from God and take it to the people. And so it was also during this time that those that Moses were leading, that that he would go and he would be with God. And they they knew that that God had promised that he would take them to this promised land, right? And and they were increasingly becoming more frustrated that, that it had not come yet for God's timing to lead them there. So what would happen is they would get frustrated that, that God wasn't doing the things that he promised in his covenant in the way and at the time that they wanted. And so they would express this frustration to God. They would make bad choices. Moses would go back up on the mountain to be with God, and he would come back down and, and oftentimes deliver punishment from God to the people. So in chapter 32, Moses is up on Mount Sinai, and the people that he's leading have become so frustrated that they said, we're just going to find somebody else to worship. Moses has been up there forever. We don't have any idea when he's even coming down. And so Moses with God, the people are down here frustrated. Aaron is there kind of on behalf of Moses leading the people. So the people go to Aaron and they say, look, we don't know when Moses is coming back. And we don't know when he comes back what he's going to have for us from God. But we're frustrated. We want to go to this promised land that God has told us about that we've waited on for generations. And because Moses is gone, because he didn't say when he was coming back, and we're not sure when he'll be done, we need to do something now and so they convince Aaron that they need to create an idol and this is the the story maybe you remember of creating this golden calf so Aaron calls all the people together and asks them for what scripture calls their ornaments this would be earrings and jewelry and things made of gold and they bring all of it together and and Aaron takes all those things and he and he melts it down and and he makes a golden calf and all this time Moses is up on the mountain with God he has no idea what the people are doing And so the the day after this, the morning after Aaron had built this golden calf, the people basically had a big party. They brought burnt offerings and offerings of worship and offerings of sacrifice and offerings of peace. And and Scripture says at the end of that description in 32 that the people rose up to play. And so it was this big party worshiping this golden calf that they had asked Aaron to create because they were frustrated with God and frustrated with Moses. And what is so uniquely dangerous about this is that the same offerings, the same worship, the same sacrifices that they had made to Yahweh, the holy God, at the base of Mount Sinai to signify their obedience to the covenant, they made those same offerings to an idol. And so in chapter 32, verse 7, let's read this together. God notices, obviously, what's going on, though Moses doesn't. And here's the beginning of that dialogue in verse 7 of chapter 32. And the Lord said to Moses, go down for your people whom you've brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. 
They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you. God is so angry at the people. He's not angry with Moses because, again, he's, he's told Moses that he's found favor with him and that Moses has been faithful. But God says to Moses, these people that you're trying to lead are disobedient. They're rebellious and they're not teachable. They're stiff-necked. And God says, Moses, I need for you to leave my presence so that my, my spirit, my heart may burn against these people, then I will consume them. But he, he remembers a promise that he made to Moses that I will still make a great nation of you. But you have to remember, as much as Moses feared the Lord, he also loved these people. And he knew that he was their intercessor. He knew that he would go to God on behalf of them. And so God is angry at them, and once again, they've forsaken the covenant. But, but Moses leaves to go back to the people because God asked him to. But before he does, Moses speaks to God and implores God, God, I know that you've asked me to leave you alone so that you may burn, as Scripture says. But he says, I want you to remember, God, the covenant. God, remember the covenant you made with your people. And this is how the dialogue picks up in verse 11. Moses prays this. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say with evil intent did he bring them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven. And all this land that I have promised, I will give to your offspring and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of, bringing on his people. So Moses goes again to God on behalf of the people, and he reminds God. Obviously, God knew. He says, God, don't forget, these are your people. And I know that they're stiff-necked, as you say, and I know that they're disobedient. But God, you've made a promise to us. You've made a covenant with us that you're going to use us, and and you're going to multiply us and make great nations. And God, please, 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 don't forget your covenant. And as Moses goes to God and implores, and he stands in the gap between God and the people, Scripture, as we just read, said God relented from the disaster that he had promised. He heard Moses. And I think this is is such a powerful picture of the intimacy that Moses had in his relationship with God. As you listen to this dialogue, one thing that Scripture says is is that that God would talk to Moses as in face-to-face. Not that they were face to face, and we'll see later that that Moses never saw the face of God, but he said that he talked and he dialogued with Moses as one would talk with a friend, as one would look across from someone that they loved or someone that they cared about, and they would would talk face to face, and there'd be trust and vulnerability and intimacy and authenticity. That's how Moses' relationship was with God. And it's a reminder to us that God deeply wants that kind of intimacy with us. And I think we keep God at such a distance that we not only don't experience the fullness of his goodness, but we never allow ourselves to be in this kind of relationship with God. You see, their relationship was deep and it was real. And what Moses had with God, he desperately wanted for his people. So he continues to go on behalf of the people to God. So when you read through the life of Moses, you You read about a man, you read about a leader who had experienced the goodness of God. And you see in the life of Moses that the more he was with God, the more he understood God. And and the more he understood God, the more he realized he was experienced the goodness of God. And the more that Moses experienced the goodness of God in his life, the more desperate he became for his people. And every time in these few chapters that we read that Moses has been with God and experienced that goodness and then God sends down some measure of punishment for the people because Moses so desperately wants them to experience what he's experiencing that he goes to God continually over and over. God, please relent. Don't forget your covenant. Let them see the goodness that you've shown me. 
And like we saw last week in the story of David, when when we experience fully the, the goodness of God, we will want to invite others to be a part of that. So Moses comes down from the mountain after he's implored on the people. This is still in chapter 32. And he goes back to the people who, as he shows up back at their camp, there's the golden calf and there's the party and the dancing and the the idolatry and the worship. And Moses is furious. And the story says that Moses is bringing down two tablets of things that God had told him that he'd written down. And, And scripture gives us this detail that they were full on the front and the back. And so Moses comes down and he takes the tablets and he throws them down in front of the people and they shatter. And then he takes the shattered pieces of these tablets and scripture says that he crushed them down into a powder and he was so furious at their disobedience and so furious that they continued to to reject and forsake the covenant of God that he takes those crushed tablets and scripture says he crushed them so fine they became a powder and he took that powder and he spread it over the water and he made the children of Israel drink it. And he reminded them of their sins and reminded them that they had forsaken a God that had been so good to them. The middle part of chapter 32 goes into greater detail about their sin and the punishment. But listen as the chapter closes, as Moses once again goes to God on behalf of the people. And starting in chapter 32, verse 30, it says, The next day Moses said to the people, You have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, this people has sinned a great sin. They have made for themselves gods of gold, but now if you will forgive their sin, but if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. But the Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. But now go, lead the people to the place about which I have spoken to you, Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. Then the Lord sent a plague on the people because they had made the calf the one that Aaron made. So as chapter 33 begins, God has commanded the people to leave this area where they were, this area around Sinai, and to begin the journey, this process of going to the place that he promised. But here's what's so disheartening about what God said. See, God had always promised for for so many generations that he would take them and lead them into the promised land. And he's essentially saying here that Moses, I know that over and over again you've come to me on behalf of these people and, and they very rarely have changed their behavior. They continue to be people that have forsaken me and have forsaken my covenant. And he said, so because of that, I'm not gonna take them to the promised land. They're gonna go but I'm going to send an angel. And God says that I'll make preparations for them. But when I have to visit them, I'm going to visit their sin. And when the people heard this, they were so discouraged. And the scripture says that they mourned. They were heartbroken that their sin had led to this point in their relationship with God that he was no longer going to be the one to lead them. He calls them this stiff-necked, rebellious, unteachable people. You see, God had not forgiven up, given up on them and he had not forsaken them. But he was punishing them out of his love and out of his goodness for what they had done. So once again, Moses goes back on behalf of the people to spend time with God. Here's what scripture says, and now we're in Exodus 33, starting in verse 12. Moses said to the Lord, see, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name and You have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And he said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. Moses is is saying, God, if you're not going, we don't want to go. If you're not going to be with us, what's the point in going to a place that you've promised? And then in 16, he says, For how shall it be known that I found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? He was saying, God, how are people going to know that, that we belong to you if you send us and you don't go with us? Now listen to what happens next in verse 17. And the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do. For you have found favor in my sight, 
and know you, and I know you by name. Here's what Moses says. Moses said, please show me your glory. God, please show me your glory. And God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there's a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand until I pass by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. See, in these two chapters, we, we see an incredible, intimate relationship with Moses and with God. And what I want us to see this morning is the more that Moses experiences the goodness of God, the more of God he wants. And Moses asked God a question. He is so hungry for the things of God. He is so hungry for the character of God. He is so hungry for intimacy with God. He says, God, show me your glory. Show me your glory. God, I want as much of you as you will give me. Please show me your glory. And God's answer is this. Moses, I will let my goodness pass before you. So here's a couple things I want you to keep in mind with this relationship we see with God and Moses. The first is this. The glory of God is his goodness. The glory of God is his goodness. The the glory of God, which glory means the, the way that God reveals himself to us. And oftentimes, In the Old Testament, the glory of God would be seen in in different signs, clouds and fire and pillar of smoke, different things that God would use to reveal his glory to his people, meaning he would show them more of himself. And and Moses is so desperate and so hungry for more of God. And this wasn't a Moses that had not been with God and, and had needed to catch up with God. This was a man that spent every day with God. And the more of God he wanted the more of God he wanted. The more of God's goodness he experienced, the more he kept asking God, show me that I found favor. Show me more of you. Show me more of you. Up until the point he says, God, show me your glory. And God says, I reveal my glory to you by letting my goodness pass before your life. Saying, Moses, think about all the goodness in your life. Think about all the ways you have experienced my goodness. He says, when you see my goodness, you're seeing me because that's how I'm revealing my glory to you by allowing you to experience my goodness. You see, in our lives, I think the same is true. God reveals his glory, meaning his, himself, his character, and who he is by allowing his goodness to pass by us in our life. And I wonder how often it passes by us and, and we don't even know because we haven't been with God. That's why I think this relationship is so important to our understanding of the goodness of God because Moses had been with God, and God says, when you're with me, my goodness passes before you, and as it does, I'm showing you, I'm revealing my glory to you. So in your life, are you experiencing the glory of God? Are you experiencing the glory of God? Are you craving him more and more and more every day? As you're with God in the morning or in the evening and you read the scriptures, is it drudgery? Is it it's something that you feel you need to do? Are you really tasting and seeing that God is good and the more you're with him, the more you want to be with him? The glory of God is his goodness. And he tells us in that passage a couple of ways we can know that. One is this. He says, the goodness of God is often revealed through the graciousness of God. He says, I will be gracious upon who I'll be gracious and I'll show mercy to whom I will show mercy. You see, grace is that unmerited favor and compassion of God. It's it's often revealed in his goodness. You see, God had shown compassion to Moses. Over and over again, he had listened to Moses. And he had relented because he was showing grace to Moses and to the people of Israel. He extended compassion to them even in the midst of their sinfulness. This is an important lesson for us is that even in the midst of our sinfulness, God extends his goodness to us. He's showing us his glory by letting us experience how gracious he is. And as he showed them his grace, he was reminding them that when when you experience my grace, when you experience my compassion, I'm letting my glory be revealed. I'm letting my goodness 
pass before you. And I think what he was reminding Moses is that as Moses was asking for more and more and more, God was reminding him, Moses, I'm showing you so much. I'm showing you goodness by showing you grace. I'm showing the people goodness by showing them grace through my compassion. And as his goodness passed by them, he was revealing himself to them. And then he says this, the goodness of God is often revealed through the mercies of God. The goodness of God is often revealed through the mercies of God. So he tells Moses that I'm showing you my glory by allowing my goodness to pass by you. And and you're going to recognize its goodness by my grace and by my mercies. You see, mercy is also a word that means compassion. But in in a deeper sense, mercy is a word that means forbearance. So in our language, it's a word that means restraint or patience. And I think God was reminding Moses, Moses, I've shown you my glory. I've allowed my goodness to pass by you and by the people. And he said, one of the ways that you can recognize that is how merciful I've shown these people. How many times I've withheld my wrath from their their sinfulness and their disobedience and their rebellion. And I've, I've shown forbearance and I've been patient and patient. Time and time again, I've shown you my mercy. And time and time again, I've shown the people that I'm a merciful God. And every time I do, Moses, I'm allowing my goodness to pass by them. So Moses, you're asking for my glory. You're asking to see more of me. And he said, I want to remind you that every moment when you experience the graciousness of my compassion and the mercy of my patience and forbearance, I'm allowing that goodness to pass by you. And as that goodness passes by you, I am revealing to you who I am. I'm showing you my glory. I'm manifesting who I am. I'm manifesting my love for you with compassion, with mercy. So consider in your own life the grace and the mercy of God. Consider the passion, compassion that God has shown you. Consider the patience that God has shown you. And how often are we desperate for more of God? Yet we often overlook the grace and mercy that he's shown us in our lives every day. You see, I think every moment of every day is an opportunity for the goodness of God to pass by us. For him to show us grace and compassion. For him to show us mercy and and patience and forbearance. And, And I know because of our sinfulness, we don't always know what God is up to. But just know that out of his character, because he is good, and we're celebrating that all the time, that our lives are full of these moments where his goodness and his glory is passing by us. It's passing by through mercy and patience and forbearance. It's passing by his grace and compassion and love. And, and, and I want to recognize the goodness of God in my own life by finding the ways that he's been gracious and finding the places where he's extended mercy to me. So think about your life. How has God been gracious to you? How has he shown mercy to you? You see, the more that we experience intimacy with God, the more that we'll desire the goodness of God. I think there's a really interesting tension that we have to be honest about when we talk about God's goodness, and it's this, if you feel like, or if I feel like in my life, man, I'm just not experiencing the goodness of God that I want to. It's often because we're not being with God. The more that Moses was with God in a deep and intimate and meaningful way, the more of God's goodness he craved, the more he couldn't get enough of God. And I think in our lives, we've become very satisfied that we've got just enough of God in our lives not to disrupt our lives. But if we really want to see that God is good so that we can celebrate that goodness all the time, then we have to be with God. Because the more that we're with him, the more that we want desperately to experience his goodness. So, church, in your life, let me ask you this. Don't you want to live a life like Moses? Don't you want to go up on the mountain and be with God? Don't you want to have a place every day where you go to and no matter what happened the day before, no matter how you feel when you wake up or no matter what is going on in your life, you know for these moments and at this place, you know that you're going to meet with God. Find that place in your life, wherever that that mountain is where Moses would get away and he would forget about all that was going down below and he would just be with God. Maybe if you're like me, it's, Man, it's a chair on your back porch where you know that every morning you can go and just be with God. Maybe it's at your office when you get there early before anyone else. 
Maybe it's your front porch. Maybe it's just a place that you know you can go to every day and be with God in such a way that more and more every day our heart grows hungrier for the things of God. So here's my encouragement to us today based on the life that we read about. Let's decide today that we will no longer as a people be satisfied with a superficial, sporadic relationship with God. With a rebellious relationship where we forsake the covenant that we've made with God if we're a follower of God. Let's not live lives like the people who God would call stiff-necked because we get tired of waiting on God so we decide to do something else. Let's be people that are no longer satisfied with living like that. Let's be people that get up to the mountain to be with God. Because when we're with God, we experience his goodness. And as we experience it, we will want more and more and more of it. And God desperately wants to know us more and more and more. So today is a great day to get right with God. If you're here today or if you're watching this morning with us, if there's never been a time in your life where you've surrendered your life to the person of Jesus Christ, you've understood that that he is the remedy for your sin, that he came as Moses was a mediator between God and the people, Jesus himself came to stand in the gap for us and to provide a way for us to be right with God. And if there's never been a time where you've surrendered and entrusted your life to God through his son Jesus, trust him today. Experience his goodness. And understand the joy that comes from growing in a deep, intimate relationship with the God who by his very nature is good. But if you are a follower of Jesus, if you're a person that claims faith in God, I want to challenge you to no longer live a life being satisfied with a superficial relationship with God. No longer be satisfied where you're not experiencing the goodness of God in your life because you're not being with God. And make margin and make time and sacrifice things in your life so that each and every day you can go up to that mountain, wherever that is for you, and you can simply be with God and know God deeper so you can experience his goodness. You see, his goodness is his glory. And as we saw at the end of that passage, he can't allow us to see him face to face. He's going to pass by us. But as he passes by us, he's going to allow his goodness to show up in our life, often through grace and often through mercy. And I imagine today that God is through his Holy Spirit, stirring our hearts for a desire for more of him. So wherever you are this morning on your spiritual journey, if you're outside of the faith and you need a new relationship with God, or if you're a person that says you're a follower of Jesus, but you're, but you're not experiencing a deep hunger for the things of God, today's a great day to be right with God. And I encourage you and pray that you'll do whatever is necessary, that you will allow the Holy Spirit to move in your life in such a way that you can be a person that desperately desires the goodness of God by simply becoming a person that is with God. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes just for a moment. When I read through the story of Moses and his relationship with God, even just in these two chapters, I'm often deeply convicted in my own life and in my lack of discipline at times and in my satisfaction with just a little bit of God. And I desperately want more of God in my life. I know that there's such greater depths of his goodness that he can show me if I will be with him and spend time with him and obey him and respond to his goodness. So wherever you are today in your life, whatever is necessary for the Holy Spirit to do, I just pray in these moments that God would find us to be a people who are obedient. So God, in these moments, for those that are here on campus, those that are with us online, God, whatever you need to do in our lives, would you make it so clear? God, would your Holy Spirit pierce our hearts and and, and penetrate our souls in such a way that you make it so obvious of the things in our life that are keeping us from you? God, would you forgive us? God, would you set us free from, from addictions? Would you set us free from apathy? Would you set us free from all the things that that keep us from being a people that are desperate for you and for your goodness. And God, would you help us to see that you often reveal your glory to us by allowing your goodness to pass by us. We can see it in your grace and your mercy, your patience and your compassion towards us. So God, help us to experience your goodness deeply. And God, help us to celebrate who you are as we do. In Jesus' name, amen.